Hey folks, welcome back. Today is the second in our three-part series on the Netflix film, The Social Dilemma, the contentious film. Today we have Abhi Gupta, the founder and principal researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. We had an incredibly fruity conversation and we covered many thorny issues. I really enjoyed the conversation. Keith had his own take on overcoming our weaknesses and undermining our vulnerabilities. We spoke about the threat landscape and blind spots. We spoke about differential reality versus universal shaping. We spoke about shared reality, incentives and tools, federated information autonomy, diversity is a metric, inclusion is a strategy, how locally aligned pockets can stabilize global diversity, making inclusion easier with tools, open sourcing the algorithms, the N plus one cost of inclusion, and we finish off by talking about the broader impact statement that we see on many of these research papers these days. So Facebook put out an official article about this, which is what the social dilemma gets wrong. They said that we should have conversations about the impact of social media on our lives but the social dilemma buries the substance in sensationalism. Rather than offer a nuanced look at technology, it gives a distorted view of how social media platforms work to create a convenient scapegoat for what are difficult and complex societal problems. The film's creators do not include insights from those currently working in the companies or any experts that take a different view to the narrative put forward by that film. They also don't acknowledge, critically or otherwise, the efforts already taken by companies to address many of the issues they raise. Instead, they rely on commentary from those who haven't been on the inside for many years. Here are the core points that the film gets wrong. So it talks about addiction. Facebook builds its products to create value, not to be addictive. Two, you are the product. Facebook says that it's funded by advertising so that it remains free to people. Three, the algorithms. Facebook's algorithm is not mad, it keeps the platform relevant and useful. Four, data. Facebook has made improvements across the company to protect people's privacy. Five, polarization. We take steps to reduce content that could drive polarization. Six, elections. Facebook has made investments to protect the integrity of elections. Seven, misinformation. We fight fake news, misinformation and harmful content using a global network of fact-checking partners. So um, feel free to go and check out this uh, article. The only one of those seven points which rubs me a little bit, I think, is asserting that you are not the product. Clearly, you are the product. I think we're just arguing about semantics here. One of the people said in the film that they're not necessarily selling you. They are selling your attention and they're selling the ability to change your perceptions and change what you pay attention to. That's what they're selling, and, and it clearly has huge market value, and, and advertisers are, are prepared to pay for that. So I think it's a little bit disingenuous to try and claim that's not the product or that you're not the product, because clearly it's very closely related. Anyway, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. We really love reading your comments, and we had a lot of fun making this episode. Remember to check us out next week when we have Dr. Rebecca Roach, who's a senior lecturer in philosophy and ethics at Royal Holloway University of London. I'm super excited about that episode. Peace out. I do want to pick up on one specific thing, though. Yeah, well. uh, so you brought up what I thought was a, a truly brilliant quote, like one of the very interesting points made where this guy said, we've been worried all this time about when AI would overcome our strengths, yeah. when we really should have been worried about when it would overcome our weaknesses. Yeah. And, and Yannick, you were kind of like, ah, that's just, you can just you take one minus weakness and you get a strength or whatever. I think that that misses the point, which is that every every individual, we do have sets of strengths and weaknesses. And I think we could define that formally if we wanted to, like a behavior that we have greater or lesser degree of conscious control over or whatnot. But I think it makes this very valid point that kind of in all our doomsday AI thinking, we've always been worried about when will they be able to shoot down all our 
aircraft carriers with a nano laser beam or yeah. something like that. Whereas really, this is a bigger problem for us is when is AI going to allow systems and other people to just abuse our kind of weaknesses that have crept into us over millions of years of evolution to the point where it just degrades our productivity, I think. For the most part, that's already uh, happened, right? If you look at the YouTube kids, I think it was uh, late 2017, I believe. I forget his name now. I forget his name. Anyways, uh, there's this guy who did uh, a bunch of investigation in terms of uh, the kinds of videos that were gaining popularity on on YouTube kids. And, and a lot of them were actually quite disturbing in terms of the content, like definitely not appropriate for children, but in a very subtle way. Uh, so they were psychologically disturbing, yet made with cartoon characters, which I think is the worst kind of uh, disturbing content that you can make. It's like those uh, little evil babies that you have or the, the puppets that have gone evil. So it, it was that kind of freaky, right? And certainly that's the kind of content I think where, and this was one of the guys, uh, Guillaume Chazlo, who was in the social dilemma as well. Unfortunately, didn't get enough airtime. Tristan Harris uh, monopolized most of it. I don't know if he funded the movie, did he? I am not sure, but it seemed he certainly seems did. That way. He, seems that way. He, he spoke for the longest uh, out of everybody. Um, funded it but, with all uh, the money he's made off of human futures. You know? Oh, oh, yeah. Tell yeah. Me. And, and you know what was interesting? And I don't know what you guys think about this, but it's... It's fascinating that the people that they have brought on to talk about this, it's when we're talking about, it's almost like they've had a moral awakening, which is great. God bless them. God bless us for having that. But when they talk about, oh, we didn't know that this could happen, that I, I, I don't agree with. The, and, and one of the examples that I wanted to talk about was they, a lot of these folks went through BJ Fogg's Center for Persuasive Technology Lab. So you got to be kidding me. It has it in its title of the lab that it's about persuasive technology. So w where was the disillusionment there? Yeah, it was obvious that's what you were, you know, uh, signing up to do. That's something I'd like to discuss today is when did they cross the line? Because clearly every technology can have unintended consequences. And, and I believe them when they said that the like button was not they had no conception that it would lead to some of the problems that, that, that it has. But at some point, they, they crossed the line. But anyway, let, let's introduce everyone properly, and, and then we can kick yeah. off into the discussion. Today, we have a good friend of mine, Abby Gupta. So uh, Abby is best described as an incredible force of nature. He is an AI ethics researcher, and he's working on creating ethical, safe, and inclusive AI. He's the founder and principal researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. He's a machine learning engineer at Microsoft, and we were partners in crime at Microsoft for several years, and he's on the responsible AI board in CSE at Microsoft. He represented Canada in the Future of Work program for the US State Department, and he earned his degree in computer science from McGill University, which is the same place as our friend Bengio works now, of course. Uh, we'll link to his website um, after the show as well, because he's got a, quite an impressive list of accolades on, on his website. But also joining us today is Yannick Lightspeed Kilcher. We have Alex Bayesian Stenlake. And we also have MIT PhD Dr. Keith, also Bayesian, Duggar. <laughs> now, <laughs> there have been some. Wait, oh, well, wait. Go on. <laughs> oh, no, just before we go further, because we had a comment about us butchering names, and, and I'm not an expert in pronouncing names. Abby, how, what's the proper way to pronounce your name? For today yeah no abby is great uh, abby. that's what okay. all, all the people who like me call me abby and those who don't call me abby shakes uh, okay and, <laughs> so abby abby maybe, is good. maybe this changes during the video <laughs> yeah we got in trouble for mispronouncing. because i've known sachin for for many years now and i've clearly been saying his name wrong the whole time well i think it was mainly but, me but that, that's why i'm no it was me checking. too i looked oh, at the okay. pronunciation and it, it was me too but anyway um <laughs> coming back to the social dilemma so um there have been some huge concerns about social media in general and it's been said that social media games and deranges our attention instagram for example um it can learn many things about you without taking any explicit actions in the system. For example, it could learn your sexual orientation just by measuring the amount of time that you look at certain pictures. So it, it could be concerning for, from a privacy point of view. Some have claimed that social media might represent a kind of climate change of culture polluting our social fabric. So should social media be regulated? There were naysayers before the smoking ban and seatbelt regulations were introduced, but now no one's suggesting we should 
turn the clock back. Who gets to define what hate speech is? And what is acceptable public discourse? As the film said, the current best proxy for truth is a human click. It's simply not possible to tell algorithmically if something is true or not. So could social media undermine democracy? Is it a good use of our time? Or is it paternalistic to dictate what is and what isn't a good use of our time? Is this just a moral panic? Is social media improving society in some ways? Society is changing fast and perhaps it's not possible to put the genie back in the bottle. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Anyway, this is our street talk today and welcome to the show. Abby, it's, it's fantastic to have you on. Hey, pleasure to be here. Glad to have a chance to talk about this. Uh, hopefully we'll get into uh, <clears throat> some maybe thorny areas some maybe not so thorny areas, but I think hopefully we can peel back the sort of superficial layer that this movie has put forth, I think. In a lot of senses, I think it's done a good job because, again, folks like us who work in the industry only have uh, so much of an audience and a reach in terms of being able to convince people, but something like Netflix and presumably the people that they brought on uh, have a larger audience. So there are, you know, positives, of course, and want to make sure that we get that out of the way, lest someone fault us for saying that, uh, well, they only said bad things about the movie and then talk about any of the positives. Why don't we um, kick off with your take on, on the film, Abby? Yeah, no, um, I think, let me say this, because I think we'll touch on a lot of aspects uh, here. One of the things that caught my attention was uh, a particular gripe that I've had with a lot of popular media portrayal of AI systems, which is anthropomorphizing everything, right? So again, here, what is AI uh, being a person, or, or rather three people in this context, optimizing for monetization and engagement and, and whatever else. My concern with that is I think it continues to misinform the public. I understand that it's hard to portray an algorithm in a way that's probably visually engaging, though I, I will say that there are ways to do it. If you look at the uh, the Stitch Fix uh, website, right? So they've got a great blog where they visualize some of the algorithms and how they operate and how they go about their data science workflows. Uh, it, it's, it's quite stunning, actually, and, and quite accessible to uh, people who maybe aren't uh, well versed with it. I feel it's a cop out for them to have an impersonation uh, or to have people represent those AI systems. Uh, because again, it's pushing the narrative that uh, whenever AI is deployed or portrayed, it's it's always in the form of an embodied intelligence, which is the problem with Terminator and uh, everything else that all, all these sort of popular portrayals, whereas the, the truth is a lot more ambient in the sense that it's basically an add-on feature in our existing software systems, right? And there's nothing, there's no flashbang and it's like, oh, look at this genie AI embodied robot thing that's shown up. And it, 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 it honestly is just an additional feature that maybe boosts your productivity, hopefully. Uh, at least that's what people claim. But just, I think, misportrayal. And I, and I think that was one of the things that isn't being talked about enough, which I think uh, ought to be discussed, though there are, of course, many other things. That but, but just a gentle challenge on that, because um, Tristan said that we thought that AI would overwhelm our strengths, but it undermined our weaknesses. In a way, that's what you've said. It's not this anthropomorphic, embodied intelligence it's actually something quite simple and diffuse but it's still apparently overcome us yeah yeah no and i think a part of it is also when we're talking about our weakness i think of course they made the point that our brains haven't evolved to ingest the the flood of information that we have the number of connections that we have the number of connections that we try to keep up with the kind of social validation that we get and all of those things and and I think, I, I forget who it was, I think it was McNamee who uh, made that uh, comment where it's, it's it's this adversarial dynamic, right? Where on the one hand, you have a, a system uh, where we have the system that has so much information about us that's, that's sort of fighting against us to steal our attention. And on the other hand, we're still are in our cave people roots with our primitive brains uh, trying to fight back. Of course, we're outmatched. There's this interesting point around the attention economy that was raised in the film where they were discussing, oh, they're timing push notifications very precisely to capture your attention. Firstly, frankly, I don't ever remember a push notification that distracted me. In fact, they usually get turned off because I get sick of having 50 lined up. But I think that sort of, that sort of capturing of the attention economy 
missing the point of like where the threat actually comes from. There's more interesting and more subtle changes of behavior here. And in fact, I think it was you that identified it years and years ago, looking at the way that Gmail autocomplete limits our range of expression. And there's, if you want to talk about like effects on human culture, surely like we should be paying attention to this sort of stuff. They, can you unpack some of the, I guess, some of the blind spots within the film using your experience with the broader ethical challenges of AI? Yeah, yeah, no, and, and that's a great example. I, yeah, totally uh, should have mentioned that. That's great that you brought that up. Because this is, so there's a bit of auto nudging with, with those sort of boxed responses that you get on your Android or iPhone app. But there's also, of course, the smart compose, right? Which, uh, again, subtly nudges you towards conforming to particular styles. On another note, you can think about examples in terms of how we're altering our conversation styles when it comes to smart home assistants as well. If Alexa uh, doesn't understand what you're saying, you rephrase your conversation until it gets it, right? Which is the opposite of what we want is for the technology to adapt to us and not for us to adopt, uh, adapt to, to technology, right? On, on a broader note, I think one of the things and relating it back to the movie that wasn't really covered and should have been made a bit more explicit is uh, they talked about how social validation, a lot of younger teens and folks are, are deriving their uh, sort of social validation from the, these quantified uh, metrics that are that are on there. So I'm wondering if it would have made sense for them to talk about, there was a study that came out from, from the Algorithmic Watch. Uh, so it's an organization based out of Europe who analyzed how Instagram, just by the way it promotes different kinds of posts, actually nudged people into showing more skin because that's what ended up performing better, right? So there's there's a reshaping of sort of cultural norms as well, where to participate in this ecosystem is not just the social validation that you're getting, but also your social norms that are evolving where you taking a fully clothed picture of yourself on vacation is not beneficial from a social validation perspective anymore. Uh, it's in fact that you have to show as much skin as possible because that is what will, you know, get engagement, will show up organically for other people to watch and provide you with validation. But wasn't that always the case? Like, it doesn't really matter where you show your vacation pictures if uh, at least, like, either more skin is beneficial or more skin is detrimental to the success of the picture it doesn't it, it's not it you, i get the point that this is vastly amplified and actually modifies social behavior in a way that you you might not be be aware of it but i would say yeah and also so to the general more general point of these gmail autocomplete and whatnot of course you can say it boxes you in it limits your expressivity but on the other hand i think what these systems show us is that we're not so unique after all. Like most of us will complete that email with one of these three sentences minus plus a few typos. And I mean, the entire recommendation system industry is based on the fact that humans aren't so different. Like it's, oh, you're one of those people. Okay. So yeah, I just, I think the, you formulated it well, but it was always the case. Or do you see a particular distinction with the social media systems that wasn't there, like that wasn't there when you just showed your pictures to your friends. Just a tiny add on to that. Instagram has made this happen more efficiently and faster, but why does sex sell? Why does showing more skin get more engagement? I think it's culturally determined to a certain extent because Alex is in China at the moment. When I went to China, they have a very different culture, almost an asexual kind of infantilizing culture. I would imagine Instagram in China would be quite different. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. WeChat is a very different world. Taking a look at how things spread on WeChat now, obviously, there are some people pulling some levers in the background there deliberately, but for the most part, it's fairly organic. It, if, if you have an idea of a stereotype of what Japan might be like, that's what WeChat feels, except not just photos of girls, although that certainly exists, cars and food. A hell of a lot of time, it's cars and food. You know, 
Insta- Instagram certainly has people sharing their food, but nothing to the extent of what I've seen here in China. So, Abi, you've, you've talked a bit about misframing of the movie and so on. So if you were given like the budget and the task of making this movie, making the movie about what the combination of social media and AI specifically, what are the dangers of that? What would your kind of focus be? What would your story be? So my story, I think, my story, in fact, I, I wanted to actually answer one of the questions that you asked, and then I'll jump into answering uh, the question around how I might have done it differently. So in terms of when you said what is different in terms of pictures, let's say over showing them in, in person versus now on social media, and Tim said, of course, it's amplified to a great extent. There's also that universalization of these aesthetics, right? So I don't know if you guys had read this a while ago where all cafes, whether you're in Mumbai or Monaco or Montreal, they all now look the same. They've got that exposed brick, those uh, four plants and the the Edison bulbs and, and what have you, right? So again, there's that shaping that's happening, I think, which is, uh, I think it's stealing away the richness. And I'm with you, Yannick, that we're maybe not as unique as we think we are. But I would expect a cafe in Mumbai to look different from a cafe in Montreal. If I wanted a cafe that looks like a Montreal cafe, I would go to Montreal and not to Mumbai. But I think there's that universalization of the aesthetic which platforms like Instagram have promoted. There's a philosophical thing, though, because one of the points the film raises is this differential reality that everyone has the option whether or not to follow someone on Facebook and to present their own identity as a kind of snowflake. And even though you you can look at it as being quite conformalized, actually just look at the number of permutations of things that you may choose to follow or not. It, 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 it creates a very unique reality for everyone. So I'm going to, I'm going to push back on that and say, do we really have free choice in, in picking the people that we choose to follow? And and the reason I bring that up is because you're shown a certain set of recommendation based on who they think you're most likely to connect with. If they show me someone who's like way outside of my network, I will probably not click on it, not connect with them, which harms their underlying motives. In which case they are actually to a great extent curtailing the kind of choices that I have. And, and just even in the order of um, a display of the connections that I should connect with or, or the friends that I should connect with probably plays a role. So if someone is fifth down on the list, I'm not as likely to click on them as the person who is up top. So I don't know, there's probably something to be said there as well in terms of what kind of choices we have. But, but are the forces regularizing or chaotic? If, if, if you have 10 groups on Facebook, that's two to the power of 10 permutations of combinations and if you did have a certain Mm -hmm. permutation would that reality be very different to another reality because the question is it a bit like the butterfly flaps its wings and you end up there's a storm the other side of the world or does it not really matter which combination of things you follow does it it doesn't really make any difference i yeah i I don't know I, i i think to a certain extent it does have an impact, right? In the sense that if if I were to not click on a certain set of groups, I might not be shown some of the downstream recommendations that could have, let's say I was to subscribe to the 5G uh, spreading the coronavirus conspiracy thing, right? Uh, Now that they know that's one thing that I'm interested in, it's opened up this realm of possibilities in terms of everything else, uh, Pizzagate or flat earth and whatever other conspiracy theories. But if I was to not click on that, and then of course there's a whole other pathway in terms of the groups that I would be shown. And then then of course that has a cascading effect the further down we go, right? Because I now become a part of those communities and and that starts to become my world. You almost get indoctrinated depending on also a little bit your sort of savvy with digital and, and, and media. This idea pushes back on what Yannick was saying earlier about the success of the recommender system industry. Yes, it's a successful industry, but how much of this is runaway feedback loops that no one's really watching and people have only become aware of in the last couple of years? These, this idea of the differentiation of realities, how much of that is just we've got these recommender systems that can drive a sufficient critical mass of people towards given narratives? 
how much of it actually is a diffusion of points of view and how much of it's runaway feedback feedback effects locking people into kind of like epistemic bubbles would be one way of thinking it absolutely i'm not ever debating that i completely agree with that point i was just like just the fact that recommender systems work and work in non-arbitrary ways is obvious because people aren't that unique not everyone is like duper unique you are actually similar to other people and i think that the solution and i've said this on the last segment is to find a way to monetize breaking out of the recommender system and this the same way the solution to misinformation and whatnot is to be to find a way to monetize truth and i'm a fan of pro- crypto projects like augur and betting markets where i think the only way you're going to get there is through money uh, honestly mm-hmm. like through or some sort of other capital like social reputation but money i feel is the is the big deal here and the solution to all of this it's so probably I'm also gonna... the source of all of it so yeah, I, yes, I'm going to agree with Yannick there, which is that when you can project things down to the space of money, it becomes a much more sort of reliable measure. The other thing to do, and this is this philosophy of make the right thing easy to do, which is if we believe that there's a social good, for example, in exposing people to anti-beliefs, things opposite of what they currently believe, Why couldn't a search engine like Google, for example, just have two columns of display there? Like, here's all the things that you agree with. And then for each one of these links, we're also presenting you with, and maybe it's an optional thing. I click like show anti-beliefs and it shows me the top links that people on the other side of the viewpoint, we might find that if that tool set was available, that people would engage with it. We don't know. Maybe we would find that 30% 30% of the time, people go for the cognitive dissonance and go to engage things that they don't like the people that say, yeah, I listen to Rush Limbaugh, I hate him, but I just want to see all the, hear all the nutty stuff that the other side is thinking. But we have to give that tool set to them. We have to give people the mm-hmm. options rather than only automatically funneling them down further and further crystallization of their current beliefs. I give that all of 30 minutes before some public relation firm weaponizes it. (laughs) That's okay. I I don't look, I'm one of those, when it comes to say free speech, I'm one of those people that believe the antidote to free speech is more free speech and the antidote to, to messy technology is more technology. And, And so, okay, fine. Like somebody figures out how to weaponize it. We can figure out how to create defenses against it in clever ways. But I think the option is just, more freedom, more availability, more tools, uh, more transparency, rather than more constraints, more hidden features, more, you know. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, no, and and yeah, I'm with you on that. And I think there have been demonstrations where, you know, providing people with those tool sets actually does help nudge their behaviors into seemingly being a little more self-reflective, right? For example, they limited in India to prevent the spread of misinformation on WhatsApp. They limited the number of people that you can forward the messages to at a time. And that's actually helped in terms of now people, instead of mass forwarding a message to all the groups that you're a part of, you have to think for a second before making that choice. So it's almost in a sense analogy, but it's a little bit like the character constraints on Twitter, where now you have to be pithy and you have to be careful in terms of what you can be verbose. You have to pick what you're saying. Of course, you can you know, thread it out and do whatever. But uh, for the purpose of one tweet, of course, that, that is something that's possible. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring it back to one other thing Yannick said. And, and for the listeners, he had to drop early. He, that's why he's gone. He's not offended at anything we said. But uh, he mentioned, okay, say this autocomplete. Like it's whatever system is recommending completions of the sentence I'm writing and we're worried that it's going to constrain our freedom. The way I look at that is I'm, I look positively at the possibilities of that new world. So if actually an AI gets good enough to understand and predict what I want to say that I only have to tweak 20% of the email instead of writing out 100% of the email I don't see a problem with that because I I like to just in my mind do these thought experiments of the ultra extreme end of that uh, that path, if you will. And it makes me think of a series of science fiction novels by Ian Banks 
called the, the culture series. Right? We're in there. It's this hyper intelligence and basically everything is done for people. They they want for nothing. And so then at that point, everybody's just trying to find ways to entertain themselves and enjoy life because everything's taken care of them. I don't necessarily think that's a, a bad outcome. What happens in these sort of social, like in the social media dilemma, yes, if we have a teenager who's spending an inordinate amount of their time comparing themselves to impossible standards and worrying about every like and and whatever, then that's a damaging kind of activity, right? Because it's harming their psychology. It's making them more likely to hurt themselves. It's sucking up all their their time that they should be spending learning. Maybe the solution there is just better tools to make sure they, they only spend a fraction of their time on that like one hour a day. And this is where like the tool set that, for example, is available to parents needs significant improvement because, for example, Apple, okay, on the iPhone, they have these parental controls and screen time controls and everything. One, it's a pain to set them up. Two, there's like loopholes in there that the kids find and you have to constantly go watch YouTube videos and websites to make sure you're catching all those and plugging them up. Uh, There's even applications that completely ignore them. It's like one of the the games my son loves to play. However, they've just totally gotten away with disregarding the screen time 100%. Right? So then I got to go to my Wi-Fi network and and have it shut down at a certain time of the day. In other words, and I'm a technology guy, so I can do all this stuff. But for a lot of parents, it's beyond their capabilities. They can't keep up with all this. So we need better tools. We need more tooling, better tools, easier to understand tools to make the right thing easier to do. So you're saying it's fundamentally a a policy plus technology problem. Yeah, it's an individual choice, including the individual choice of parents to figure out how they think their kids should be regulated, plus the tooling necessary to implement those uh, those choices. Even things like me personally, for example, if there was a if there was an app that really could prevent me from overusing social media or, or something, I might install that. But the way they are right now, they have loopholes. And since I know the loopholes, I'm going to use the loopholes. So I think we just need much better tooling and, and ideas around how to regulate our behaviors. Can we define what constitutes pathological usage? Because in the introduction, I talked about this paternalistic culture where Mm -hmm. we assume that gamblers are always wasting their time. Why would they want to throw away their money like that? And it's the same thing with people who take drugs recreationally. And even in those cohorts, you can break it up. So there's roughly 10% of people that clearly have a pathology they develop an addiction which has certain characteristics, like you, you hide your usage from other people when you have a kind of withdrawal and so on. But there's also a long tail, isn't there? That there's a middle tier of usage where one might say that it's not a good use of your time. But do yeah, we I, have the right I, that, to say like, that? So I'm much more open personally about it. I don't think gambling is a waste of time. I think if it dominates a person's life to the point where it's damaging their health, and psychology and all that, then it's a problem. I don't think, I think lots of drugs shouldn't be illegal. I think actually, for example, we legalized drugs, say in the United States, but required that they pass the same degree of approval that medications do. In other words, they have to demonstrate efficaciousness, safety, et cetera. That's probably a better world. And if if you don't get along with your in-laws and they're coming over for a visit, who cares if you go to the pharmacy and pick up a little purple pill that helps you get through the evening, right? If it's not going to harm you and kill you. And so if we open this up and give people the freedom and choice and make it safer and make it easier for them to do the right things, to moderate their behavior, to not become addicted, that's a better approach. But sure, there is a line, right? Well, just on that, because um, addiction is a symptom of a toxic environment. So a a lot of people, they get addicted to the, for example, if I gave you a load of heroin tomorrow, even if you took it, you wouldn't get it. It's quite difficult to get addicted to heroin. People get addicted to it because they have shit life syndrome and they want to reduce attention to their stresses. And people get addicted to gambling for similar reasons. But with um, Facebook, it's a little bit more esoteric, right? It's the thing, is it a bad thing for people to watch videos of dogs? It might be soothing for people just to temporarily escape from their work environment and just to immerse themselves in the world of uh, puppy videos. 
I was literally commenting to my family in the family group chat today, SpongeBob SquarePants, since I don't touch drugs, <laughs> haven't even touched weed since I was a kid, but SpongeBob SquarePants videos, man, it's I'm there. <laughs> so Tim brings up an interesting point and as do you keep in, in, in the sense that they can offer a reprieve when you're going through stress. And of course, the one point that I liked that you made was around having clear information vetted information in terms of the efficaciousness, in terms of the safety. So ultimately, I think, and give me some rope here, but I think what we're trying to say is that we need to have sufficient transparency and information so that people are able to make an informed choice. And I think that's what's missing is in an environment like Facebook, we don't have uh, uh, an informed decision-making process because we think it's benign. And I I think it was, uh, I, I forget who's, there were two children in the video that they showed. There was a brother and a sister. So there was the dramatization part, but there was one of the one of the speakers' children, mm-hmm. and and they when they were asked how much time they spent, they were they underestimated it because they didn't know. And I think yeah. that's where the problem is. That which also relates to your point around tooling in making that a lot more upfront, making that a lot more transparent and and effective. Because that's also partly what's lacking is the efficaciousness there. I'm interested to know where you draw the line, though, because you you could (laughs) argue that, you know, in philosophy, there's the the experience machine, which is imagine you could go into virtual reality and just live in the perfect uh, world. Everything was wonderful and you wouldn't want to leave. And Facebook is about as close to that as you could possibly imagine. When you go in there, uh, as I said, it, even uh, the guy yesterday, we had Andy Smith on, a security consultant, and he said he was really careful. He doesn't give away anything about himself when he uses social media. But of course, that's rubbish. Even the amount of time you spend looking at every piece of information, they're profiling you and they're showing you a reality just for you. And you get drawn in. And the whole purpose of this technology is to be persuasive and to derange your attention and manipulate you. So it, it, do we, philosophically, is this a binary? Is this just a bad thing? Or is there a, a line we can draw on susceptibility? There's a slope. Can I, can I open this question up a little bit more? Because I know Abby has done a lot of work, like a lot of consulting work with companies and governments on like how to tackle these challenges that come up. Can we kind of broaden this just beyond the, the range of the individual and start to talk about like, how does how do the broad divisions in society how should they respond to this what sort of action should they be taking what sort of action should they be avoiding yeah no and so it's an interesting point in the sense that i see the point around us or us i say some group being paternalistic and and prescribing to others what is good or what is bad and i think it it boils down to self determination for that group and I would say what happens at the individual level also probably to a certain extent scales to a group level as well, where if you're offering a a sufficient amount of information for them to choose whether something aligns with their culture, with their context, with their values, and allows them, more importantly, empowers them to make that choice. I think that's what's important because it's also useless if I tell you that, hey, this is all, these are all the ways that you're being manipulated in. Does it conform with your values or not? But oh, I don't give you any power to actually change any of that. That also is useless. So I think there's that second piece, which is, do are we empowering them to be able to make that change? And often that piece gets ignored, which is also my gripe. I want to quickly touch back on the question that Yannick had asked, and I haven't forgotten about how uh, I would reuse what I think was partially a waste of time in the movie, how they went about it was to not talk sufficiently about the potential solutions. Blocking all your notifications isn't a solution. Like what, what, it, it's 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 a bandaid on a dam that's broken. Like the bandaid is going to do nothing. It, it, had they had they taken each of the scenarios and actually walked through what some of the policy and technical instruments can be. So let's say we're talking about the. The, the online to offline violence that happened in, in India and in Myanmar. Let's talk about what some of the policy changes were that were enacted after that. What was the effect? What was the effectiveness of those policy measures? What were some of the technological measures that were put in place? Were they effective? Were they not effective? And I think that would have been much more realistic. You could have cut out all that dramatization part 
uh, honestly, if you ask me, and have replaced it, drop in, replace it with, with solutions, because that's what's missing. And again, to your point, Alex, in terms of when I speak with governments and companies and all of this, everybody is great at identifying problems, right? Which we, we love to do that. Of course, it's fun to point out problems, but let's also try and move towards solutions, and which has been an issue in this space as well, in the space of AI ethics, where um, everybody loves to identify problems in terms of privacy, in terms of bias and fairness and misinformation. And when you start to ask the hard questions about what are some potential solutions, then it's like, oh, well, we, we haven't really given it that much thought. So I'm like, so isn't that the point? <laughs> on, on, on that, because in Myanmar, I think they had four local moderators that spoke the language. And the, the platform that they have, the way that Facebook is monetized is anyone can go on the platform and they can promote content. So that's exactly what happened. And of course, this can undermine democracy and, and cause all sorts of problems. So there is a fundamental I'm, I'm conflict sure between their revenue model and how it's being used. I think when we say things like it undermines democracy, I mean, you know, does it? Yeah. At the end of the day, if people are voting, it's always been the case that, say, charismatic, well-spoken people persuade other people to do what they want them to do. And, and to a large extent, people uh, have their opinions based on their friends, their families, where they grew up, their you know, the, the narratives that they're being told and whatnot. So I, I don't I don't know that there's really anything new here. And I think a lot of times when we say it's undermining democracy, it's really just that whatever the outcome was, we didn't like. And therefore, yeah. let's say that it's undermining something that everybody cares about, like democracy. But I just want to pull back for a second just to the, the point that Abby raised about, again, the transparency, the availability of accurate information and tooling to empower people to make their own informed decisions. I think that's the route that we have to go, which is it's just distributed control idea. Provide, make sure that we're providing good information. And by the way, as open and transparent information as we can. I don't want some monolithic government deciding what's true and what's false. Like that's sort of an absurd situation to be in. But just providing people the tooling and the knowledge, the information they need to come to informed decisions. And then just let the chips fall where they fall. It's like, if, we, if we've if we told you the bad things that can happen if you become addicted to social media, given you the information, given you alternatives, given you tooling to control them, at the end of the day, if your neural net that you were born with and that you grew over time decides to just ignore all that and get addicted, that's life. Like, we can't control everybody. We can't micromanage every autonomous, you know, entity, I, these human beings walking around. I'm quite persuaded by Keith's notion of having a federated approach to social media. But it, we are in the age of globalization. And it is, in a way, it is a monolithic application that everyone logs into. And one of the interesting sticking points here is the, the relative notions of knowledge and values and truth. And depending on where you are in the political spectrum, you might argue that one of those three things is absolute or constructed in some way. So how do you how does that fit into the paradigm of potentially having a federated social media? Federation is the only way to allow that, which is just look, if a bunch of people want to believe that that there's no that your genes don't influence you whatsoever, that it's all environment and culturally constructed, fine. We also need to have a space where people that want to believe differently can believe differently, and they're not allowed to silence each other. That again, the antidote to one side's free speech is more free speech from the other side. So it's that federated system. And when governments seek to do regulations, I think they need to do so. They need to create regulations that are very incremental, very, very simple, very flexible, just to create this kind of fair, open, transparent sort of space. Like, for example, suppose that a regular came along and said, okay, fine, Google, you go ahead and keep providing targeted searches to everybody, but you have to have a button on the page that's default search or something that I can click on, and it doesn't use my personal information. And every single person viewing that search sees the exact same results, right? Well, that's like very that's target Go, isn't it? Duck, well, duck, go but, is like but again, Google minus the tracking. 
Right. But again, so what I'm saying is forcing the platforms that that are doing tracking to provide an easy way for people to choose to not be exposed to that within the platform of their choice. Like that's the kind of regulation, ultra simple, easy for Google to do. Like, I don't care what they come back with. This is like one hour of coding, you know, maximum to provide this, this capability. Okay. And yet it empowers people to at least see the scary other side that, that, you know, maybe doesn't, agree precisely with my opinions. Can I just have a a quick point on that? Because one of the reasons I I was arguing that a federated system might be dangerous is because we have this kind of differential consciousness now. Everyone sees a different world when they log into Facebook. And there's been a huge uptick in postmodernism in the last 10 years or so. And there are people out there that think that mathematics is a is a meta narrative it's a social construct and two plus two only equals four in the western world and it's just it's something that we've created and that, that's okay that's okay yeah, if are, are, are if you saying people. are you saying that those people should be allowed to construct that yep. reality when they log into social media i'm saying they should be allowed to construct that they should be allowed to believe that they should be allowed to test their ideas in reality they shouldn't be allowed to suppress and cancel people that disagree with them. And we as a society may decide that it's also a good thing that they have easy tools to go see the other side, like buttons that they can click that at least show them what other people are up to and thinking. I came up through the social sciences. Math was not part of my formal education. And it's amazing how intimidate or how often people will discourage or or disparage these things simply because they think, oh, I can't understand it. Or my interpretation is they, because they can't understand it, they're inclined to dismiss it. It's much harder to admit fault and to move through this. But when you sit down with someone, you actually walk them through what everything means. People change their opinions on this. It just takes that kind of moment of listening, right? Like this idea of a shattering of narratives is completely okay, so long as people are willing to sit down and listen to one another. And that's the crux of the issue. How do you fix that when there's so much political power, there's so much advantage to be gained in maintaining that hostility? This is a great system, but I I don't see it working. Let me just make one really quick comment, which is number one most important criteria is that people can't silence other people. A second possibly important criteria is that we may want to encourage people to listen to others, but we absolutely can't allow people to silence people that disagree with them. Mm-hmm. No, and, and so actually to build build on your point, what so if, if we go back to days when communities were simple, where travel wasn't possible to be far off lands and, and everything, right? If you had a, a view that, was potentially misinformed, let's say, two plus two is five, let's say. You had a community of people around you who could potentially act as a you know, sort of self-correcting mechanism, right? Where to, to Alex's point, someone would sit down with you and then talk you through their reasoning and, and hopefully get you to change your mind that two plus two is not five, right? And I'll caveat that by saying that, of course, because we were not exposed to other parts of the world, we might hold views that are actually just wrong as a community, and and that couldn't be broken open, right? That I admit. But uh, what's changed now compared to this scenario is that you can always find self-confirming evidence for Mm -hmm. whatever niche, no matter how niche your view is, you can probably find a subreddit for it or a you know tiny Twitter community that's probably going to align with what you're saying, is going to support what you're saying, is going to show you more evidence to to make you you know harden your beliefs. And I think that's the problem where we, as Keith was saying, we it's become it's becoming increasingly difficult for you to break out of those bubbles because maybe we don't have the tooling, maybe we don't have enough. Uh, willpower, I don't know. There's a lot of problems there. And 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 to the point on, you know, Dr. Go being uh, an alternative where it's Google minus, I guess, the personalization. How many people know of Dr. Go? That's why I'm saying it needs to be a, a potential regulation. And I'm not saying this one, but a potential one could just be that if you're a search engine, you have to provide this this experience as a little button that's larger than one pixel that people can uh, click on if, if they want to. 
And so I often make the analogy that the the internet has become this fortress of echo chambers mm. where everybody walks in there, goes down a long hallway, finds the door that leads to the dungeon that has all the people that believe the exact precise same set of things that they believe. They go in there and they never come out again. And maybe it's a good idea that we build some little connecting hallways there and, and make it easy for people to get exposed to some of the other dungeons. Yeah, it's a bit like in Star Trek Voyager when they had the Borg had the the subspace network so they could travel around <laughs> the galaxy. Because again, there is an interesting philosophical point about do we have a, an infinitely fractured reality, or you could imagine the space of all humans as being in a room, and in one part of the room you might have LGBT people and another, you know, and you can cluster it and you can show people well topologically here's where you are. Because one of the reasons we spoke about the kind of package deal concept that at the moment you can, if you join a conspiracy theory group like the, the 5G, then you tend to get the package deal. So then they'll recommend to you that you should be an anti-vaxxer as well and you should do this, <laughs> that and the other. But there, there should be an opportunity to visualize where you are inside that room and give you some subspace wormholes to escape from where you are if you want mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. So here's a here's a problem. Right now we're recognizing that there's a diversity of viewpoints and that we should inc- we should absolutely not silence these viewpoints. That's right. right. We understand that there are some similarities there, but within those groups, those similarities, like we know from social psychology, that people are going to differentiate themselves. They're going to find the they're going to focus on the points of difference rather than the the similarities. And then there's this idea in AI ethics, and, and I kind of want to turn this across to Abby, of representativeness and ensuring that the, like any discussion, particularly concerning bias, is very inclusive and we try to engage with all relevant stakeholders. How do we marry? This problem just seems like a wicked policy problem with no way out. It's you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. Is there a solution there? So, you know, I think as a starting point, when we're talking about representativeness, I think there's also this sort of related problem of of these four gatekeepers. And the four gatekeepers are these, let's say, individuals or organizations that claim to represent a particular group, but they really don't. And a huge problem in the field right now when you're talking about, you know, how it's such a wicked problem is how do we reach those people whom we should be speaking with who actually have the lived experiences so that we can surface whatever their culture, their value, their norms are so that we can incorporate that into whatever vision making we have to do. And the the problem right now, and this is uh, this has been a, an ongoing topic at the Institute where we've been fascinated by how the space itself of AI ethics in particular has been monopolized by a few voices, has been monopolized by a few voices that are eating up the floor space, the airtime, they're pushing the very voices that they claim to represent, that they claim to want to empower to the fringes, out of the spotlight. And what was interesting in terms of that discussion was as some of these people who are are meant to represent the voices of the people who are traditionally marginalized to talk about, let's say, bias and fairness issues, they all end up suffering from the same problem of uh, the replication of the power structures, which is as you start to become more uh, famous or you start to get more speaking requests or whatever else it is, you tend to aggregate that within your own uh, interests or whatever uh, to the exclusion of very people that you were supposed to help out in the first place, the, your, your own very in-group. That you were supposed this to was, help, but you end up. This was Maria Farrell's big criticism of the social dilemma, the so called prodigal tech bro. And she said, yeah. and they're all men. And for those yeah. of you who aren't out there that don't know this story, basically, Maria Farrell says there are fantastic ethical advocates, researchers out there, sorry, AI ethics advocates, researchers, et cetera, but they get no airtime because these people that are quite well funded that put forward middle of the road solutions that don't actually solve the problem, eat right. up all the airtime and get these great big budgets. I, I want to challenge you on this concept of a lived experience. And and well, we've just been talking as well about how the, the guys on the film were men and well funded and so on. But I, I'm just a little bit worried about that because one thing one thing I'm a little bit 
allergic to is is this idea of a group categorization being the single most defining thing about you. And I resent the idea that because I'm a white male that it disentitles me to talk about certain things. And the problem with the lived experience is that you could say anything. You could say, because I'm a category X, Y, Z, I've had this experience and it's disprovable. So is that almost a debasing of the way that we think about ethics? Before we go down that very deep rabbit hole, before we go down there, let me just give my perspective on something because it may actually address your concern like that, which is because of where I work, uh, diversity, inclusion, a very high priority, undergone quite a bit of training over it or on it over the last few years. And what I've come to realize actually is that diversity is a metric. Inclusion is a strategy, right? And if we, if we did perfect inclusion, if we were perfect at inclusion, whatever diversity results from that is the ideal diversity, and it may not exactly reflect the exact combinatorial demographics of the population in any particular area because diversity is itself diverse. You know, so people do have different experiences growing up, different cultural experiences as a result of that, as a result of who they are. They'll have different interests, right? They'll have different areas of expertise, different skill sets, et cetera. So we can't expect that on every possible imaginable dimension in every niche in life, the population is going to precisely reflect the population in that niche. There has to be variation or we're in fact denying the relevance of diversity at all, right? So what I found is that a hyper focus on inclusion, okay, and that includes outreach as well. Okay, a community is not being represented in, in something in which we believe they have a stake. We should devote resources into outreach there, going out asking like, hey, are, are you guys interested in participating in this? Do you want to be part of the conversation? We'd love to have you. You know, so for example, if coding is dominated by a, a particular group, outreach to all the other groups. Make sure that there are no barriers to members from that group being included. So just a hyper, hyper, hyper focus on getting inclusion perfect, I think is is our way forward. And then to use diversity as a guide for where, or lack of diversity, say, as a guide for maybe where we're falling down or where there's more resources that need to be invested, But after we've done that examination and that research and perfected inclusion, it's okay if it doesn't exactly reflect the population, right? Metrics, not targets, yeah. Maybe maybe I'll I'll chime in with one thing to to build on Keith's point in terms of inclusion being the the, the go-to strategy in terms of uh, achieving some of the outcomes that we do want to as a society. There's also, there's there's the sort of external-facing aspect of inclusion. But then there's also the internal facing aspect of inclusion, which is making sure that the people that we do actually bring in through this now enhanced inclusion process to actually feel welcome so that they don't leave. Because yep. they, you, you do often have that people enter the field, but then they exit because they're uncomfortable because of just so many reasons. And I think that also is, is something that that needs to be practiced and like, made a priority. And things like, of course, training, things like better understanding of the different sort of perspectives that people are coming from, different even maybe educational experiences. It's almost like uh, don't fault someone for using uh, Emacs if you're a whim guy mm-hmm. or, or the other way around, uh, to, to give you a silly analogy there. But that's that understanding uh, and, and tolerance, I think. Yeah, tolerance really is the word. Or maybe it's the wrong word. We're not really tolerating anything. It's just being open. Because I think right. toler- tolerating has a negative connotation. But yeah, just, like for um, example, the commented the commenter that brought up that, and I know I did mispronouncing um, uh, Sachin's name, right? And I hope I said it correctly there. I watch videos. I tried. That's an example of where let's suppose you're Southeast Asian from India, and, and you join a company that just happens to be mostly people from the United States, and they're always mispronouncing your name. And they don't even care. Like they're not even trying actually to learn how to pronounce your name, right? That can be kind of an 
an exclusionary sort of behavior because you feel, man, every day I come in here, nobody's even bothering to learn my name. You know, it's it's awareness of all that kind of stuff, which again is about inclusion that we need to to be more focused on. And I welcome, like, I love the training that I get and thinking about these things. For example, I always tried to make sure that in a meeting, if somebody was quiet, or not saying much, I would try to reach out to them. Hey, John, did, did you want to comment on this? However, then I learned that some people that can be put on the spot like that may actually make them feel uncomfortable. So a little change of tactic was instead of calling them out in the meeting, I would message them, right? And say, hey, John, do you have any, you know, if you want to add any comments, please speak up or let me know. I can introduce you. Learning about all these little tactics for inclusion, very, very helpful. And I'd love to see more of that. Just on that, though, if you include one person, you exclude another person. And if we have a thought experiment here, imagine if Facebook didn't have the recommendation algorithm. Imagine if it was completely random. And when you saw information on your feed, you it just stratified across every possible interest and characteristic. Because what happens at the moment is it's about convergence versus divergence. So Facebook will, it has a kind of convergent behavior and groups of people will form bases of attraction and you'll get clusters of knowledge and thought and so on. If you have the complete opposite, which is pure divergence, then you'll create some kind of a monoculture which doesn't really have any defining characteristics at all. And presumably we don't want that either. So where do we draw the line? Hmm. But is that yeah. something that we don't want? Let me just put a, a kind of visual on that so we can think about it. Mm -hmm. Is that, and again, I, I live in the United States, so that's why I'm using these examples here. I'm not trying to be US centric. I just don't have enough knowledge to comment elsewhere. In the United States, for example, lots of ethnic groups self segregate into particular neighborhoods. Like, for example, you've heard like Chinatown. In my view, like some of that is good, right? Because having a lot of people nearby each other with the same culture helps them to maintain that. You know, they can have a store that has a culturally appropriate food and they can get the things that they're familiar with. They have neighbors that share the culture. They can group together to build a temple down the road and whatnot. So, some degree of kind of, of alignment geographically helps them to maintain their diversity, right? If we just spread everybody all around and had like every square mile had the exact same combination of, of demographics, I think we would lose actually a lot of that diversity. So the United States actually isn't a melting pot. It's a tossed salad. There's all little bits and pieces everywhere. And for me, that's a good thing. It's what helps us maintain that diversity. Yeah, another example of that is there's this concept of cultural appropriation. Uh, which means hypothetically, if I was to wear a, a, a sombrero, that would be cultural appropriation. But in a way, diversity is cultural appropriation because I'm, I'm, I'm selecting loads of different folks to work in my group. And what happens is things either converge or diverge. It's just a, it's a mathematical reality. Yep. So yep. you take a diverse group of people and, and you make them work together. And what happens is you take a kind of five-point average. All of those folks will converge in the middle and characteristics of all of their knowledge and, and values will be combined into one. So isn't that just a form of cultural appropriation? So Tim, you're saying that, so if we were to have a team of, of people that was, let's say, diverse along some axes, let's say, uh, and 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 they they formed sort of five clusters that they would all converge to a center to which at which point they would lose their diversity is that that's my hypothesis i think there's this concept of groupthink uh, there there are many right. biases we have like social proof for example we we look at the decisions of others to inform our own decisions and i i, on, I honestly believe that we're always moving and we're strongly mm -hmm. influenced by our environment and our peer group and you, you do get this convergence, and surely that would happen eventually. DNA has this very interesting property, at least the genetic system of life on Earth has this kind of interesting property that it actually maintains digitally the variety of information, but in a state like absent any outside influences, it maintains that information stably over time. So, for example, if, if you have a diversity of hair color, black, blonde, red, 
brown, whatever, actually that population will keep that exact same diversity over the course of time forever. It will always have 5% redheads, 20% blonde, whatever the percentages are, they'll stay stable. And you'll see these, you'll see this variety continue to pop up over time just because of the kind of digital nature of the genetic code. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. I'd like you to to give me some intuition why. Does that mean that it's not a heritable trait? It's actually a consistent mutation? No, it's heritable, but it's decomposed into gene, like, and I'm going to simplify a lot of things here. So anybody out there, if you jump on me on the comments, understand we're trying to like, keep things flowing in a simple way here. But let's just suppose every trait is represented by genes, okay? And and there's one or more uh, versions of that gene. There can be uh, version A, B, C, for example. Those versions are stable. And again, absent mutation, absent selection, they never change. If at some point I could write this down on a whiteboard and you could see that the this, there's a polynomial that kind of shows you that the frequencies of these alleles stay the same. And therefore, over time, you can get all the different combinations of those alleles. So you wind up keeping blonde people and brown haired people and red haired people and everything else, you maintain all those combinations because the genes themselves are digital and stable, but they occur in different combinations. But surely Um, we're overlooking mutations at this point because red hair naturally is very recessive and only kind of shows up because there's this a subpopulation with a mutation that only shows up in small, relatively isolated areas of the earth. Yeah. So I said overlooking mutation and selective pressure, because if you have selective pressure, then it can change these balances. But the point I'm making there is that it's possible to maintain variety. But in order to do that, you have to have a component of that variety that's stable. So like the gene is stable, for example. And having these populations like a a Chinatown or an area of town that's highly Indian, for example, represents a stable gene that can continue to produce this variation and maintain this diversity over time and sending out branches that can float off into the larger population and spread that diversity. A quick point on that. It depends what you mean by, because your point is there are a lot of behavioral traits which are biologically determined and changes in your biology can produce a whole bunch of different physical and behavioral um, changes. But what we're talking about are almost a, a level of abstraction on top of that. I, yeah, I yeah. think um, that there is there's yeah. our culture and our language and so on. And this is almost a, a form of externalized behavior or knowledge. Uh, no, I agree with you. It, I'm just yeah. saying this. I'm saying that the same mathematics can apply to that, which is that if you can maintain, if you have some degree of alignment, right, you can maintain that diversity over time while at the same time still allowing mixtures of that diversity to occur elsewhere. It's just you have to keep these pockets around to maintain that or or what you said will happen, which is they'll just muddle together and converge into kind of like a a gray soup or something. But, but you're making the argument, just forget about genetics for a minute, that the same applies in some way to our culture and our language. Yep. So I am. even if you have a group of people together for a significant amount of time, the diversity will be maintained. Yeah. I'll as long as they one. keep as long as they keep pockets. So that so you have to maintain these pockets, which are the gene itself has to be maintained somewhere. Right. It has to be maintained somewhere. But just on that, science, for example, is a form of externalized intelligence. It's a collective. And yeah. we were talking on LinkedIn the other day. We said that science advances one funeral at a time. And right. there's incredible convergent behavior, not least triggered by the when you have reviews on papers, they all have to be accepts. And I think I was making the comment. I stole this from Kenneth Stanley, by the way. Kenneth is coming on our show in a few weeks' time. He, he made the argument that it should be maximum disagreement, not maximum agreement. So it seems to me that there are so many mechanisms when you have groups of people that cause convergent, not divergent mm-hmm. behavior rooting this back into uh, ethics of AI and these broader sort of power structures, this idea of, of isolated pockets, it works out until you introduce things like social power structures and the wildly different experiences people have growing up within these communities. A, a friend of mine, he's, he's, he's an African 
from America, not African American, but grew up with many of the same social problems and many of the same fears. And I remember hanging out with him one day back in Australia. And I'd, I'd had a couple of cops, heavily armored cops, knock on my door that day because they were looking for someone that used to live there and they meet me and they were very confused and I was very confused. So, invited them into my house and had a glass of water and Sid tried to figure out what was going on and turns out you know, this other person had moved or whatever. I'm recounting this to my friend and he's looking at me with eyes like saucers and he's, you invited them into your house? There is no way in hell I'd ever do that. And it, it didn't even cross my mind to be nervous in that situation. It's just like, oh, this is weird. Come on in, have a glass of water. It's fine. He's laughing at me, this, this white boy letting the cops into his house, etc. So, like, uh, interacting with those social power structures, like, people will, people will tend to converge because moving towards those uh, power structures or rather moving away from them carries real costs. Maintaining an identity carries real costs and often it's enforced, right? Like it, the America's not exactly, like Australia is not a model for race relations either, but I think we need to be very careful how we think about this because these broader structures that can influence things do completely change people's relationships uh, even between one another. And so, we, we do need to take into account these different perspectives because they're just as valid. We can't just dismiss it and say they're lacking evidence. Statistically, it's all the same. Statistically, cops rock up to the house. It's a case of mistaken identity. They were looking for a guy from Brazil. Like They weren't going to mistake my friend for him either. But two people, same situation, radically different responses because they're this broader context really does matter. And introducing this context can help us to spot things that otherwise we'd miss. Mm -hmm. And I think, Alex, to your point, that's exactly what the benefit of having that sort of diversity on the team is, right? Is that if we were to uh, talk about that, you inviting the cops in, it, it did not absolutely occur to you at all. But that would be something that your you know a friend would have pointed out right away if this was some other context based on your differences in experience they would be like hey we're designing this product this thing doesn't work you know let, let me give you the example of and, uh, and so it's a pretty uh, famous one where you have that soap dispenser where you put your hand underneath it and it, it only works for light skin uh, guess what all the testers on the team had light skin and they were like uh, yeah, every time I put my hand it, uh, it it works out so nothing wrong there uh, good to go let's ship it out and and then lo and behold a dark person uh, a person with uh, dark skin puts their hand and, and nothing gets dispensed so it's covering each other's blind spots I think that's the benefit and I don't know if it leads to a convergence as, as Tim was you know saying maybe it does but to Keith's point, I think if, if we continue to maintain at least a portion of our identities, be that through other mechanisms that are external to that group where you're creating that diversity in a single setting, I, I think you would still continue to reap the benefits without many of the sort of negative consequences. Could we make a distinction, though, because you gave the example of the hand um, sanitizer not recognizing dark colored skin and there was the gender shades paper uh, talking about the differences in predictive accuracy on facial recognition systems and those are egregious of course they should work for everyone that's just a, a, a simple um, case of fairness but the problem is this line of reasoning can just go one step further and one step further so, so the next step is to say that all of the systems uh, of power in our society have been inadvertently not designed is the wrong word, but they've been constructed in a way to systematically oppress people of certain categorizations. And at that point, then it, it becomes quite difficult to to disprove or to reason about that. I mean, how do you take that on? Hmm. Well, there's always extremes, you know, and the pendulum always swings and there's always a line at some point where where it starts to become nonsensical. Like, you know, I'm sorry, folks out there, mathematics is not racist, right? Like arithmetic is not racist, you know, uh, symbolic integration isn't racist, right? But on the other hand, court stenographers in the United States have shown that, and this applies, by the way, to both black and white court stenographers, 
have uh, have shown far greater errors in typing up the spoken words of uh, black defendants and people giving testimony in court, right? So there's some type linguistic relationship there. And I think what has to happen is we have to be like always on the lookout for things like that. This happens, the thing with the hands, you know, that happens actually in even more severe cases in the medical field where they don't do a good job with the randomized kind of sampling of the population. And we end up with medications that work well for men and not women or that work well for Caucasians and don't work well for Blacks. So we've got to be aware of of where there are, you know, and almost obsessively, you know, looking around for for cases where that, that might arise. But then if we go so far as to start saying, yeah, the scientific method is racist. I mean, I'm sorry, those folks that believe that, you can continue believing that. I'm not going to try and stop you from from saying that. You don't try to stop me from saying that you're a little nuts and we'll agree to disagree. And you try to apply your theories to the real world and we'll try to apply ours. And eventually natural selection will figure out whose ideas are, are scientifically correct. So I, I, I don't think anyone's suggesting that these systems were designed to be <laughs> tyrannical, but the, the problem is it, it's about the consequences. Clearly these systems have consequences which affect certain groups in a negative way. But how do you then address that problem? By a constant, by being hyper vigilant to, to look for that and also open to anytime somebody does come and say, Hey, we think there's a problem over here. Like anytime we find a disparity, we need to go examine that carefully. So if we find that groups are are disparate in their representation somewhere, it has to be examined very carefully. If somebody comes and complains, hey, the, the soap washing machine's not working for me, let's not dismiss that, right? So in other words, be inclusive, hyper, hyper inclusive of all feedback. Oh, really? It's it's not working? Let's figure out why. There's a correlation here. People with dark skin, it's not working. Uh-oh. Uh, I'd like to... I'd like to briefly shout out to a girl I had the pleasure of meeting in Brisbane. Her name's Loren Legasic. She's a diversity consultant. And at first you might think, oh, is this, there is a bit of a stigma around people that claim this sort of stuff, but she is the real deal. Why? Because she focuses on, she doesn't focus on minor hypothetical problems and just nitpicking. What she does is she focuses on things that are really major really large impact stuff that get completely overlooked, like colorblindness support for your website Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or visually impaired support for apps, right? These are things that affect a huge number of people and it boggles the mind how often companies don't even consider that sort of stuff. There will be people that go out there and say it's all deliberate, but really the, the problem with the power argument is that it doesn't require humans to reproduce itself. It just... That's right. You know, these, these problems reinforce themselves over time. And so we need to be aware of, of the impacts of this system, of the voices that we're not necessarily hearing, and to really go and seek them out. And again, like this rolls back to the inclusivity argument. Uh, there, there is still this problem of how much effort do we invest? Like, what's our bang for buck here, given that we don't necessarily have unlimited resources, but there's so much easy stuff that if people are just made aware of the basic stuff, and this is where things like uh, the Montreal AI Ethics Institute, like some of the blogs that you guys have been putting out this year have been really good at just flagging this stuff so that people don't need to go out and discover this stuff for themselves. Yeah, no, and I I, I appreciate the shout out there. To your point around... When we're thinking about, okay, things like colorblindness support or all of these things, I'm not saying they're simple to implement, but they're, for for the most part, things that we figured out how to do. And it should be, as you said, it's just making people aware of that. And I think... Uh, it's it's also uh, if if you look at Microsoft, Microsoft has a ton of great support for accessibility features, right? That they're built into each of the applications. Makes it, it, to to Keith's point from earlier, it's just you got to make it that simple and frictionless for people to just do it, right? Where it's like, oh, you, do right. you need captions for your videos? Oh, right. here's a convenient button. Let's just enable captions and it'll whatever transcript it, create the captions, and throw them up on the screen or whatever. And that that that's what we need. And 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 that's where I think it's it's just a matter of getting people to realize that 
being inclusive is not burdensome it's it it should be something it's let me put it this way it should be the norm rather than the exception and again bringing up keith's point if if we make it easy if we make it frictionless uh, people have shown a propensity to actually put that into practice uh, yeah can i people generally up, like to like, do the right thing right that's right and so it's about making the right thing easy to do so just to continue with abby's point and specifically on the color blindness so Believe it or not, like color science for various reasons happened to be happens to be a hobby of mine, or it was for a long time. And I cared a lot actually about making my graphs and things like that accessible to people with various forms of color blindness, because there actually turns out there's more than more than one way in which you can be colorblind. So I learned about like the Scilab color space and how I can choose colors that have contrast on dimensions that colorblind people were likely to see. And that was the the scales I used for my heat maps and like all that kind of stuff. However, even though I put effort into it, and even though I went far beyond what a normal person would do to try and achieve that, right? Fast forward for some years, it's still, it's not going to be easy for me to incorporate that knowledge. I'm going to have to create custom templates and all kinds of stuff. So this is where like AI and just better tooling, better software can make the world such a better place is by making it automatic or very easy to have accessible documents. And I'd love to see more investment in that. And to the point that was made earlier about where's what's our bang for the buck here, this is one of those things where we have to err on the side of hyper-inclusivity, even if it costs us as a civilization a little bit more to implement. Um, it's, it's, it's paid back in all kinds of you know, ways that we really can't even predict. The, the thing that concerns me a tiny bit, though, is that we're talking about things that no one would possibly disagree on. We, we're talking about fairness of, especially of consumption of services and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Let me give another example. Let's imagine that we were building an algorithm to hire pilots. And it's super important for pilots to be able to memorize a certain number of things in their head and also not to be colorblind. They need to see the color green. So what we do is we come up with an algorithm to predict competency for flying and we get them to do some tests to test their memory and to test their their color vision and it just so happens in this imaginary world that all of the people called david have an impaired memory and they can't see the color green and the machine learning algorithm learns that and it then predicts basically that there's a relationship between being called david and not being competent to fly we put this machine learning model into production and now we don't hire anyone called David. Is that a moral aberration? The spurious correlation that it found that David's and the sample all happen to be, in my opinion, that's wrong. You know, that's a sort of, it's a moral, a moral problem. We should look out and try to eliminate those kinds of things, but doing it's not so easy because with neural networks or whatever, who knows like what the heck the thing is learning, right? From the data set. And that's where we've got to do a tr tremendous amount more work investing in understanding how to produce data sets and, and algorithms that are more robust for these kinds of things. And we need as a community to get together and have a crowdsource database of kind of correlations that we don't like so we don't like when a name is correlated to job outcome. So for example, if in the black community in the United States, certain names are more prevalent than they are in the white community, it's wrong if a neural network learns that maybe these, these names shouldn't be hired or something. That's, that's wrong, right? So we, but we need to come together as a crowd to decide what's right and wrong in those correlations because some of them may may use a dimension that we're trying to be careful on, say gender, but for very good purposes, like, you know, detecting breast cancer, super high correlation with gender. Okay. Uh, certain diseases, super high correlation with eth ethnicity, right? We, we need to allow those. And the only way to do that is with some database where we all get together and contribute. Abby's probably done some extensive work in this area. What's the current, like, not so much the state of the art, but what's the agreed upon solution here? Like how, what's the best practice if people are encountering these problems, how should they handle it? 
So I think it's interesting in the sense that a lot of the problems, as Yankeet said, it's hard to figure out what those spurious correlations are. And I want to bring it back to the point that he made around being inclusive of feedback. What I want to add there is when we're thinking about best practices there, I think even having a mechanism to collect that feedback in the first place, where are those mechanisms? Mm-hmm. Right? Where are those mechanisms? If I find, let's say, the, the example that building off of Tim's example, that if I was David and I got selected out, how do I provide feedback on that? How do I provide? Mm-hmm. So on that note, uh, there was this extension that was created by Mozilla. It's called uh, uh, Regrets Reporter, I believe, or I, I might be butchering the name, uh, but I think it's something along those lines, Regret something. Essentially, it helps you point out your bad encounters on YouTube and report them. We need that. We need stuff like that where if we're talking about inclusion, it goes back to my point about actually empowering people to to provide feedback, to give them the ability to act. And that's where a lot of these mechanisms fall apart because if we're talking about, oh, there's these spurious correlations, there's bias in the data set, let me, the developer, the data scientist, I'll come up with something that doesn't have bias and I'll fix it. But that's the wrong way to go about it. Like you're one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle, the person who's affected should have a mechanism to provide that feedback to you. And and most of the cases, like I, unless you guys know of other examples, I don't actually know of that many that actually give you the opportunity to provide feedback where you can That's a really good point. Yeah, well, maybe it, it, this it, crowdsourcing thing can help with that. I've it's hard this, enough yeah. to even get feedback. A decision, say you're applying for a credit card. I, I actually, I think they're starting to introduce laws now, but like your insurance premium. How is my insurance premium calculated? Oh, a big random forest spat out a number and we, we based your, your premiums off that. You don't get to see the contributions. Half the time, the people that are reading like the partial dependency plots don't even understand them. Yeah. So maybe the first steps like any machine le- learning derived answer with any sort of tent, like you should be able to go to the company and say, why was this decision made? I'll take that a step I, further and say the companies should just, if yeah, companies are making socially important decisions, their mechanisms should be published openly. Like literally here in this GitHub is the code for the currently trained neural network that we're using. Because then the entire population can examine it and comment on it. But but just on that, we've done a a show about explainability recently, and machine learning algorithms are not explainable. I understand. Even if you published the neural network, it it doesn't matter. No one would understand it. But Uh, don't underestimate the capability of somebody to say, hey, look, I did this test with this neural network, and everybody that went to this high school is being rejected for some reason, right? So at least we know and we can we have a shot at resolving that. I know it's not easy, but the only sort of way forward, I think, is to open it up 100%. But, but, but even if you did, because as, as machine learning models get more complicated, they are less explainable. And some of the more sophisticated transformers models, for example, they are not explainable and never will be. But if you make it really simple and you have a rules-based system and, and the banks do that, this is the law, by the way, that they have to tell you exactly why you didn't get a credit card, then you could game it because you could say, oh, that was 15. It should have been 14. I'm going to make it 14. So it doesn't really help you either. Well, hey, if debt to income ratio should be something and you work hard to lower it, what's the problem? Maybe it's not all bad if people, quote unquote, game it. But that's a feedback loop. Look, so if, for example, to get a certain job I want, I need to have some certifications. Is it bad that I go get those certifications? Yeah, but this is the thing we were talking about last time, that when you have objective obsession and you optimize on the objectives, then you just create perverse incentives and shortcuts and you destroy the whole system. It's not black and white, though. So that's what I tried to argue back then, is it isn't this false dilemma, black, white, bad, good. Again, if I need three different certifications to increase my chance of getting hired for a job by 10%, and I work hard and go get those certifications, that's great. That's not a bad thing. I I want to let Abby comment on this, because I've got another question. (laughs) No, the, the point that I wanted to make was, so... It's something of what Keith just said, that it it isn't a dichotomy, right? So there are shades of gray in there, in the sense that 
I, I agree with Tim that a lot of this stuff is just inherently just not understandable for a human being. And human beings also, it's not understandable to people who actually work in machine learning, less so for people who don't, right? Who are computer scientists and even less so for people who are not in computer science whatsoever. So there's that. But where I think Keith's point is important is that you can have this sort of testing and poking. And that I think is a valuable activity. To give you an example, the uh, and, and I'm sure you guys came across this as well, the Twitter, uh, the cropping of the pictures, right? Where they, where they did a bunch of like poking the holes and it's like, what kind of uh, characteristics is it prioritizing in terms of which portion of the image gets uh, sort of cropped or, uh, or not based on skin tone, based on gender, based on uh, so many different things. And they did a little bit of documentation around it, right? So it's almost this notion of adversarially trying to test and see how you can break the system and encouraging that behavior and, and enabling that behavior by making that public. So that, I think, is the value to what Keith is saying. And in, in fact, uh, it, it just came out, I think, last week, where the Netherlands, I believe, has published an algorithm registry where they're trying to capture the, the details of different algorithmic systems in a publicly accessible registry. Uh, and I haven't actually taken a look at what the details of that are, but I would assume that it would facilitate the kind of uh, mechanisms that Keith is, is talking about. The other thing that I wanted to, and, and I'll turn that back to you then, Tim, because uh, I know you had something to say there, but one of the things that I found problematic when we're talking about all these incorporating feedback and, and when Alex was saying, let's say you, you had some credit decision about you and something went wrong and it's, oh, this is a random forest model, whatever. And then they say, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put a human in the loop. Because people love that. And it's, oh, we, we, here's a human in the loop. So now we're off the hook. Now we're off okay. the hook. Well, we're not. You know why? Because a human in the loop is not useful until they have meaningful control. If you're just a token human, then that's the Air France flight case where it was the flight handed over control. And it's, oh yeah, you, you still have a human in the loop. The pilot is still sitting there, except the pilot had atrophied their skills to the point where they didn't know what the signs were. And they, they just continued to think they were going up and they, they were you know, uh, you know crashing down. They were, they were stalling, right? And it's okay. You, a human in the loop is only useful if they have meaningful agency, which in a lot of cases doesn't happen. And by agency, I also you mean competence. There are lots of, we were talking about the algo shambles in the UK when they the teachers predicted the grades and people just assumed that because it was uh, in meat space, it was humans doing it, then it was all okay. And right, even with yeah, with, yeah with, with algorithms as well, of course, there's a difference between understandability and transparency. You can publish the neural network. People won't understand how it works, of course, but uh, just you to your, your point, brain, you can't publish. That's why I made the point there about we have to consider what the alternative is, right? It's if I'm choosing between a self-driving truck that has an accident rate of whatever, uh, one every hundred thousand miles versus a, a human driven truck that's rate of 10 times that. Yeah, there's a thought experiment. Would you rather fly on a plane which has been rigorously tested, but you didn't understand how it worked, or the other way around? Yeah, I think we all know what what the decision would be. So testing is super important, and you don't need to understand the system to test it. And that's why, you, of course, I advocate for ML DevOps. And as far as I'm concerned, the most important part is from after the data scientist has finished validating the model interactively. It's a non-interactive orchestration of model behavioral tests, doing things like counterfactual examples and a whole bunch of uh, a battery of tests to try and break the model, because this is the way that, that we actually operate in an engineering setting. I want to bring it back to one thing about the, the colorblind pilots, because I, I forgot to mention that there's an alternative here, right? Which is to spend a little bit of extra money to make it flyable by people that have color blindness, right? So, so you know, if we're talking about whatever the eighty million dollar F thirty five, okay, if it cost an extra one hundred dollars per airplane to have a a mode that a pilot can fly in where they're just as effective if they're color blind. That's an even better solution than just not hiring them. On, on that, because you've personified this, this um, inclusion argument, because you're making the N plus one argument. 
Because if we could spend that amount of money, why not spend more? If you give 20% of your money to charity, why not 21%? Why not 22%? Yeah, except we're talking about there's a finite pool of kind of a, a finite pool to the inclusion. So eventually we get to the point where there's a, a risk reward or inclusion versus reward profile, right? So I'm not saying if it costs an extra $10 million per plane that we do it. What I'm saying is we evaluate that trade-off and err on the side of inclusion to some degree and then leave it up sure. to the courts to decide whether that was sufficient. Sure, but that it would still converge somewhere and the exact nature of that convergence is a point to be discussed. But Abby was saying before that there was something called Ranger, I think, where on YouTube you can flag content which you think isn't inclusive or that you didn't like, if I've understood that correctly. But it's a little bit like not offending people. Uh, now you can't give a speech to more than let's say a hundred people because it only takes one person to say that I'm offended by that. And of course, uh, language is conflated with violence now. It's quite serious. So it's the same thing with, with, with inclusion that every time you include one person, you exclude another person. So it's not super clear where you draw the line here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't think that holds. Every time I include someone, I exclude someone. Like I, I can think of lots of cases where that, that doesn't hold. Exactly. Yeah, if I have a part, so I'm going to have a party this weekend. Four people are invited. Now I include a fifth one. I didn't exclude anybody. What if you've only got a capacity of five people? But now we're adding greater conditions to it. In, in other words, suppose I've got 10 positions I need to fill and I bring in a candidate pool of 50 white people. And then I actually decide I need to be more inclusive and I bring in a candidate pool of 60 people, like 50 white and 10 black, because that's what the population is or whatever. I'm still only going to hire 10 people, but I've included the entire group in the opportunity for that job. And that's what's, that's what's important here is the opportunity, right? Without that kind of bias to your color or your ethnicity or, or whatnot. So I don't think I'm, I'm excluding anyone. I think I'm only broadening out the inclusivity for the opportunity to everyone. And certainly in the case of the party, that was just a direct addition. But to your, to your point, Keith, so the example that you gave, which was, so you started, so you had 10 positions to fill, right? Yeah. And you had 50 people who, who were all white. white and, and then the, you realized that, well, you, were being, you, you weren't being inclusive. So we went out and expanded the, the potential candidate pool to be now 50 uh, white people and, and 10 black people, let's say. So we're, we're now at 60 people, but the number of spots is still 10. So I'm, I'm just thinking now in terms of Tim's point around exclusion, in a sense, the, the, the probability of, of being selected has gone down for each of the people. What might, because there is a constraint there, right? Like, had you boosted the number of positions by two as well? Maybe then we, we now actually continue to maintain the percentage probability for each of the people, but you're also being inclusive in terms of bringing in uh, a more diverse pool of candidates. Except I understand, of course, you might have resource constraints and you can only hire 10 people and not hire 12 people in the yeah. first place. Yeah, but I've included 100% of the demographics in the opportunity for that role. So there's different sort of rings of inclusion. I'm, I'm just saying in some rings of the inclusion, if you will, or some layers, including people doesn't exclude them. So it's not always the case that including another person absolutely excludes someone else. Like mm -hmm. including, or if you do include someone, maybe the cost is shared by all and then it's fair. So if, we have, if we're having a conversation, okay, and, and we, let's say we have four people here now, we brought in a fifth person. If we were being inclusive and they took up one fifth of the airtime, we've all equally shared in that. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So just because I'm aware that we're running short on time, I'm going to fire a question at Abby. Now, I actually became aware of Abby a very long time ago. I didn't realize it until I was like doing some research for this video. I'm like, hang on, I've seen this video before because Abby was one of like a, 
this, this kind of wave of voices around 2018, I think it was, beginning of 2018, everyone's talking about AI is doom and gloom or it's the Silicon Valley AI utopia. And here's this guy that's talking in sensible terms about both the challenges and the opportunities of AI. Surprisingly, like I'm a fan. However, I also found out that you guys had a hand in the ethics statements that appear in a lot of papers these days, a lot of AI papers. I believe it was it was at least the Montreal AI Ethics Institute that co-authored the recommendations that kind of went off to New Europe's and all that sort of thing and kind of led to this uh, tacked on section at the end of papers that doesn't ever quite work. Like uh, it's clear the intent is to get people to think through the consequences of their algorithms but these people aren't trained ethicists. I, given that there are more effective alternatives out there, things like fiction, things like things like practical scenarios that actually will force, like, will naturally induce people to think through these situations. Is there a motivation? Is there a justification for a section like this, which largely on reading seems to be just a, a, a tick in the box exercise? Does this actually do anything yeah. to promote ethics in AI? Just a quick extension to that. So this is the so-called broader impact statement, which has ah, been yes, around sorry. for a while now, because uh, Yannick quite often jokes about this uh, at the end of his videos, that they are largely copy and pasted. And you can just change a few words. To, so usually if it's a computer vision paper, there's a bit of blah, blah, blah about how this could potentially discriminate against people and so on. And it, it's become a, a box ticking exercise. But this is really interesting because at work as well, I'm, I'm involved in AI governance. And one of the big challenges we have is to get people to think consequentially. And of course, there, there's a limit to that because you, a lot of people don't really want to think consequentially. And even if they could, there are unintended consequences and so on. But what, what's your, your response to Alan? Alex's question. No, that's a great question. I mean, I think to the point of the relevance of broader impact statements, I think there is all, all the points in terms of criticisms are valid. I think it's the first step in the sense that it at least forces people to think about it, even if even for a second, if even for a second. I know that, of course, as everybody rushes through the cycle of neurips and ICML and iClear and then round you go again, if you're submitting your paper five minutes before the deadline, you're just going to copy and paste the ethics statement to, to just meet the deadline. And that's a problem with any uh, sort of tack on addition that you do, that it has the potential to morph into a box sticking exercise, which is what I think the problem is with something like this as well. The concern I, I would say, or the, or the thing that I would say here is that at least it makes them think for a second, which hopefully over time sets a precedent where if we were to come up with more onerous requirements, we would, we would have a, a precedent that gets said that, hey, this is something that we need to do. Now, again, I'm, I'm with you on the fact that neither of these people ethicists, and these are the people who are actually going to be the ones who are going to be reviewing the ethics statements as on the other side, because when you sign up as an author, you're also signing up to be a reviewer. And to a large extent, it's just, a, let's call it a vicious cycle. Because, But my hope is that it can turn into a virtuous cycle where there are possibly enough number of actors just through a random allotment, let's say, who would point out some ethical concerns. So let's say your paper was to come to me. I certainly would take a critical look at that. And I'm hoping that there are more and more people, such as all of us here on this call, who, if we were asked to review a paper, would carefully look at that statement. And the fact that it is there, we now have grounds to reject the paper potentially based on that, which before you didn't have an option because mm. it wasn't even there. So what, what would I say? And, and maybe it, it wouldn't even be front and center of my mind in the first place because it, it wasn't included as a part of the submission. So again, uh, these are all post hoc justifications in terms of addressing the criticisms, but I think it's at least a, uh, a tiny step in the right direction and hopefully leads to more meaningful steps there. One of the problems I have, though, with technology governance, because it's a similar thing uh, that I deal with in my job, is technology is meta, it's abstract, it's the way it's applied 
that's where it's quite easy to uh, to bring in ethical principles and so on because you might make the argument that technology is morally neutral and a lot of scientists resent having to think about how their technology might be applied because anything could be applied for nefarious purposes yeah so it's almost like we're applying this at the wrong level mm. i think part of the challenge too is they're not trained like scientists aren't trained to be philosophers and a lot of ethical, like beyond the obvious stuff, a lot of ethical things like epistemic harm. Epistemic harm is a, a phenomenon I fa find fascinating, but outside of dedicated educators and people that have spoken to de dedicated educators, most people are probably never going to be in a position to even consider such a thing. But th there's also this thing that, that there's technology, people and process. And you need yeah. all of those things. And in my opinion, technology is fairly agnostic. In, in a company, when if you're a Google, for example, you should have a very strong application governance process. Uh, yeah. You should have check-ins through the life cycle, even at inception of every project. What, what model do I use? How do I do the metric selection? How am I validating this model? How am I productionizing it? How might it be used? What are the negative consequences? All of this stuff happens at, at the application level. It can't happen mm. at the technology level. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And it's easy to complain, but it's much harder to do something. And it, uh, seeing the ethical statement as a step in the right direction, that's fair enough. I have to drop, gentlemen, but it was a pleasure to, to speak with you all. Hey, likewise, likewise, Keith. Bye-bye. Yeah, see, Keith, um, it's, it's been an amazing show. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Anyway, we've come up to time. Abby, this has been an, an absolute honor having you on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been amazing. Hey, likewise. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I think we've got to cover so much ground and, and I, yeah, I, I think the format is fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me. Abby, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. Amazing. Cool. Take care, guys, and have a great weekend. Yeah. yeah I'll talk to you. See you Bye. later. Bye. Bye.